17, 1 Kings 17, as we continue in our series on resurrections. 1 Kings 17, I'll begin reading at verse 17, 1 Kings 17, beginning at verse 17, we'll go down to verse 24, 17, down to verse 24, hear these words, the word of God. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of sitting under your truth. It is through the power of your word and the truth of the word that lives are transformed. Death becomes life. Light comes from darkness. So, Father, as we sit under the power of the truth of your word, would you speak, O oh Lord? Your children have gathered to listen. Tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly. Turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. God, is to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name. Every heart said amen. This morning, uh, today, I, I, I want to talk about pain. Um, I want to talk about um, when, when pain gets so bad, it causes you to question God. I mean, if you, if you think about it in the Bible, it, every time you mention pain, if you think about pain, immediately our minds go to our dear brother Job. Parenthetically, if you also think about great faith, you think about Job. Could it be that deep pain produces great faith? Oh, see, it's 30 seconds in. I'm already preaching. I'm, it's already good to me. Uh, could, 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 it, could it be that Deep pain is, is the very thing that produces great faith. But why do we spend our life resisting deep pain? Job, the enemies came and they took his livestock. Fire fell from the sky and killed all of his sheep. The Babylonians came and stole his camels. And in the calamity and the confrontation, every employee was murdered. Ten kids, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten kids all died from a freak accident. And if that wasn't enough, Job, who was a man of 
pillar of righteousness, strength, and good health. After all of that, his health began to decay. I'm talking about pain, loss. His wife comes to him and says, Job, you should curse God and just die. In other words, there's nothing left for you but death. Here, Job chapter 1, verse 21, his response. Job says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job teaches us something, and he's trying to give us a glimpse. He's trying to help us. He's trying to show us something. He says, you've got to have a song that can, sing, that, that can be song, a song that you can sing in every season. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Ah, you didn't get it. He's, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. See, we know how to praise a God who giveth. Oh, we know how to love a God that giveth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Next line says, you give and take away. I want to talk about a God who takes away. And how do you respond to a God that takes away? You know how to respond to a God that gives. Thank you, Jesus. But when was the last time he took it something away and you said, blessed be the name of you ain't heard no testimonies like that. You ain't read no blogs where people celebrate. I just want to thank God for all the stuff he took away in 2019 already. Can I just praise the Lord on my Instagram, my Instagram story? Can I talk about all the stuff he took? Number one, he took my job. I ain't got no job. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I, don't, I ain't seen it. Have you seen it? I ain't seen that. He took all of my husband's common sense. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. I ain't heard that. My children are acting as if they have lost their ever-loving mind. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Who say, I ain't heard no testimonies like that. So we know how to celebrate a God who gives, but we are frustrated and confused by a God who takes. And Job is saying, you got to get balance in your theology and your spiritual walk. You got a God who gives and he takes away. And when he gives and when he takes away, you should still be able to choose to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Today in our time together, I want to talk about a God that takes away. I want to talk about how do you respond to a God when he's just downright confusing you don't know which way he's going, when you don't know what he's doing, when his actions absolutely confuse you, they're unexpected. See, let me tell you something. When God gets ready to take stuff away, he, I don't know how he does it with you, but with me, he don't let me know first. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie. I'm going to keep it real with you. It's frustrating. I'd be like, God, Jesus, you see my calendar? You see what I got planned this month? You could have told me. I was just talking to you yesterday in prayer. You could have told me that calamity was coming on Wednesday. You could have gave me a heads up. I, I would have packed differently. <laughs> Sometimes he, he don't let you know what's coming. He don't give you a detailed agenda of all that he has planned. Although I've asked. How do you respond to a God that's confusing, that's disruptive, and takes things away? The woman in our passage today, if we could bring her on the stage and interview her, and interview her she'd tell you, Elijah and I, we know what it's like. 
We know what it's like when God takes away. We know what it's like when he's confusing. In 1 Kings, the children of Israel are in a time of uh, rebellion. They've fallen into idolatry. They are not worshiping Jehovah, Yahweh. They are worshiping Baal. They are they're falling into idolatry as a people. And God is raising up a prophet so that he might speak against the rebellion of the children of Israel. And he's raising up Elijah. And, and in chapter 17, we see Elijah in prophet boot camp, if you will. He He's, he's in training, learning what it is to trust and depend on God. God has brought him out to the brook, and he's sitting there by the brook, and, and he, he doesn't have any provision, doesn't have any food. He's literally living from God's hand to his mouth. There's a raven that comes in the morning and brings food to Elijah. And then there's a raven that comes in the evening and brings food to Elijah. So literally, God is feeding him from his hand to Elijah's mouth. And then he says, all right, Elijah, uh, now that you know that you depend on me and that I'll provide for you, um, I, I, want, I want to take you deeper now. I want you to go to the city, Jerephath. And, and as you go there, there's going to be a woman who I've predestined to be there. And she's going to take care of you. She's a widow woman. So he gets there to the city gate and he sees his widow there collecting sticks. And he speaks to the woman and he says, please give me water. You need to know that this is a sacrificial request because they're in a drought and a famine. Uh, they are in very hard times, and she's a widow. That means she's culturally uh, 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 dependent upon society and charity. She don't have much. As a matter of fact, if you keep listening, watching, and reading, you will see that he then not only asks for a cup of water, but he asks for a piece of bread. I said they're in a drought and a famine, and he come asking for water and food. She says, well, sir, I only have enough meal and enough, enough flour and enough oil to make one last piece. As a matter of fact, I was going to make that piece. And then my son and I were going to eat it and then prepare to die. Because we don't have any more food and I'm certain we're going to starve to death in this family. The prophet hears that and he says, Make my bread first. Now, immediately, I can tell some of y'all already got a spiritual attitude. <laughs> what you mean, make, my, make your bread? Are you serious, really, right now? Are you, are you really seriously right now? I just said, we about to die, and you talking about, okay, give you your bread first. We ain't got no extra bread, bruh. We about to die. And he like, make my bread first. Well, see... If you think more deeply and intentionally, you'll see God is setting up for a miracle. But in order for him to do the miraculous, I need you to do the sacrificial. See, some of us want sacrifice from God. We, I mean, we want miraculous from God, but we won't give sacrifice to God. You don't want to sacrifice. You don't want to give anything first. You just want God to move, but you need to move. God says, when you move, I'll move, just like that. I'll, I'll model it for you. I, when you move, then I'll move, just like that. It'll be a miracle. I know it may sound ludicrous to you, but God is saying, if you move, I will do something in your life. What happened? Did it get weird in here? What happened? Did something happen? What? The crazy thing is she does it. She does it. She makes his bread first. But she didn't know that God was about to use her obedience as an opportunity to do the miraculous in her life said, if since you sacrifice for the prophet first, you'll never run out of flour again. And you'll never run out of oil. Every time you reach in there to get flour, there'll be flour in there. Can you imagine the miracle? Can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine the excitement? I mean, I bet they laughed, they cried, they shouted, they screamed, they ran. Can you imagine how excited they were? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. They were doing like the techno version for us. Blessed be the name. Of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. Not today, not today. You give and take away. Not today, not today. Like, they are celebrating. They're so excited. Like, they are blown away at God's provision. 
He may give, and one day he may take away, but hey, not today. It is Liddy in the city up in here. Like, God is doing his thing. Like, God is moving. Yes. I was seeing God move, and he overwhelms you. I mean, he blows you away with his goodness, his favor. You know you don't deserve it. Like, I mean, have you ever, now seriously, have you ever got a miracle, a blessing, and you like low-key, you like, you really know you don't deserve it. You be like, God, because you know what I did last week. Like, you know I don't deserve this, but here you are, you give it to me, and you're just overwhelmed at God's favor, at God's blessing. You're just overwhelmed, just moved. I can only imagine how they felt. And then it happened. What's wrong with you, boy? Mama, I don't know. I'm just, <coughs> I'm, I'm sick. I can't, I can't. And it's getting worse. And it gets so worse. Till there's no more breath in this body. And this same woman that was screaming, blessed be the name of the Lord. The same woman that was celebrating his goodness is now confused by this hand. Listen to her reaction in the text. She immediately says, have you brought, have you come here, O man of God, to kill my son? But parenthetically, she don't yell at God because she's like, this is the Old Testament, he would kill me. But I will yell at the closest thing to God. Come here, Elijah. <laughs> and she yells at him on behalf of God and God. He says, did you come here? Did you save my boy from death? just so you could kill him? Or is this what it is? is? Is your God so vengeful that he's paying me back for my sins? Did he go back in my past? Yeah, I was a Gentile. Yeah, I was an idolater. Yes. Is he so vengeful that he's now paying me back? See, the thing we don't talk about in Christianity is when God doesn't do what we want him to do. When he doesn't move like we want him to move. And he's disobedient. And he's a disobedient God. You don't talk about when he does stuff that wasn't on your schedule. When he pulls stuff that wasn't in your plan. And the accusations you throw. And you become insecure and you just think maybe karma is real. Let me tell you something. If karma was real, we'd all been dead. <laughs> Come on, we got what we deserve because of what we did? Out of all the stuff you done did, look, just turn to your neighbor and just look at your neighbor and tell him, you know you've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> Come on, tell him, tell him. Some of the stuff you didn't do, you, we did it together. That's how I know some of the stuff you did was, we did some of this stuff together. It's your nasty self. Ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> karma ain't real. Karma would have taken you out by now. You want to know why you're still here after all the crazy stuff you've done in your life? Nothing but the grace of God. If it hadn't been for the grace of God all my life, I should have been dead sleeping in my grave. But the amazing grace of God said, oh, no, I've still got a purpose for your life. Despite what you've done, if the grace of God has ever saved you, and if you're sitting here by the grace of God, you ought to just thank God. For about 20 seconds, thank him for the grace of God. Karma didn't do this. Grace did this. Karma didn't do this. Grace did this. This is the grace of God. She says, what kind of God is this? Are you giving, are you paying me back for past sins? Elijah says, give me the boy. And he takes the boy. And he takes him to the upper room where he's standing, and he lays him down. And you almost think Elijah is about to rebuke her for her lack of faith and say something profound. But Elijah doesn't do that. He looks at God and makes the same accusation. Did you bring me here to kill this boy? Look at the text. Elijah's just as frustrated and confused as she is. You know what that tells me? You can be walking with God and still have moments where you don't understand him. Can, can we just keep it real in here? Can we just keep it, be, be honest? You can go to church every Sunday and have some hit your house, have some hit your life, and you look at God and be like, really? I, I mean, 
I ain't gonna say nothing crazy because you might kill me, but still, I'm like, yo, really? There are times when those of us that have been walking with the Lord for a long time, can I just tell you there's stuff that'll hit our house? Where we'll look to God and say, come on, God, what's happening? Did you, did you bring me here to die? But keep listening to Elijah. He teaches us what to do with a confusing God. He teaches us what to do with a disruptive God. He shows us what to do with a disobedient God. The four things that we learn from Elijah. Number one, Elijah would tell you and I to remember who he is. Remember who he is. Elijah clearly is frustrated, clearly is sitting in the silence of God. The text says he had to cry out three times. You know why it was three times? Because he didn't hear nothing. There are times when you cry out to God and you don't hear anything. We always talk about the time when Jesus answered my prayer right on time. I needed him on a Tuesday, and he came Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't talk about the time when you needed him on Tuesday, and it was Tuesday night, and you heard He was silent on Elijah. But when Elijah cried to him, listen to what he said. Look at the text. It says, he says, Lord, my God, I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm confused. I don't know what's going on. I don't feel like I have control. And I don't even feel like you're listening to me because I ain't heard from you yet. But even in the midst of what appears to be your silence, in the midst of your confusion, in the midst of my frustration, you still my God. You're still God. God, even in the midst of crisis, you need to understand that he is still God. Even in the midst of crisis, in the midst of frustration, he is still your God. He's the same God that woke you up this morning. Same God that put breath in your body. Same God that's holding your heart in his hand. Same God that set the moon and the stars and the sun. He is the same God so you can count on him. You can believe him. You can trust him because he's the same God. He didn't bring you here to leave. You got to stop. And the first thing you need to recognize when you're, when you're in crisis, when you're in trouble, that it is the same God. He is still God, and he's still on the throne. He is on the throne. He is not panicked. He's on the throne. He ain't trying to figure out what's next. You are. He already knows what's next. Don't use this as an opportunity because it's crisis to try to exhort your control and get on the throne. This is not the time for you to dethrone God and for you to enthrone yourself. This ain't that time. He is still God. He is still on the throne. There ain't a crisis in heaven. And since it ain't a crisis in heaven, it shouldn't be a crisis in your heart. They ain't freaking out. The alarms ain't going off. Oh, Lord, Sherry lost her job. What are we going to do? Jesus getting all the, all the angels. All oh, y'all come, Gabriel, put the horn down. We got to have an emergency meeting. Sherry lost her job. What are we going to do for Sherry? They ain't freaking out. So that means you can stop freaking out. Say, Lord, as it is in heaven, may it be in earth, in my life. He's still God. Your circumstance changed. Your situation changed. But your God ain't changed. He's still on the throne. Still on the throne. Just turn around and tell your neighbor, tell him, remember who he is. Remember who he is. Remember who he is. Even in this, even in this, he's still God. Elijah says, Lord, my God. And then, then, then the text says he cries out to God. He, he reaches out to God. Second thing I need you to remember, remember that now is not the time to run away. Not, now is not the time to run away. Now is the time to lean in. He leans into God. He, he says, he, the Bible says he cries out to God. In this moment of frustration, not only does he declare and redefine, reaffirm the relationship, but he reaches out to him. He cries out. Now ain't the time to run away. Satan's biggest strategy is to get you in a time of crisis to then take that as your exit strategy to walk away from God. He, the biggest thing he wants you to do, he wants you to get you to, he wants to get you to walk away from God. Walk away from God. He does it every time. He's been doing it ever since the garden. Genesis chapter 3. First thing he does with Eve is he gets her to question God's goodness. Three ways he gets you to walk away. Number one, he'll try to get you to question his goodness. Is the Lord good? Did he, did he say 
What it is is he knows that if you eat off this tree, you're going to be like he is. See, he's got to get you to question his goodness because it's only when you question his goodness will you then question his godness. Because if he can get you to question his goodness, then he can question his, your, his godness. And when you question his godness, then he can get you to walk away. Nobody ever walks away from a God that's good. So if he can get you thinking in your mind, he ain't good, then he can get you thinking, he ain't God. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? But here's the thing. Here's the encouragement. It's okay for you to have seasons where you question his goodness. That, that's okay. That's not, you are human. That's Okay. What's not okay is you questioning his goodness while talking to a snake. That's not okay. You can question his goodness while you're talking to the snake. God is right there in the garden. He walk around in the garden. Now is not the time to talk to a snake. Now is the time to talk to the Savior. Some of you, you're in a season where you're questioning his goodness. The problem ain't that you're questioning it. The problem is that you're talking to snakes. And let me tell you something. Snake can be anything, can be anybody. Your mama can be a snake. Did you just say my mama could be a snake? She may not be a snake, but she can sure enough be used by one. Because if she's not pushing you to this book, if she's not pushing you to this truth and pushing you to selfishness instead of selflessness, it might be a snake. Some of you married, having problems in your marriage, and you're going to get advice from your single, heathen, godless friends. <laughs> they may not be a snake, but they'll sure be used by one. How do you know the difference? If they ain't pushing you to this book, if your advisors ain't said, girl, we need to pray about this, if they ain't said, bro, we need to get in God's word, we need to start praying, then you need to check some more advisors. Now is not the time to be talking to snakes. Parenthetically, can, can I just say this? I don't know why the Lord's leading me to say this. Now ain't the time to be dating a snake either. I don't know where you are, but you up in here. I'm going to tell you something. You might be sitting next to the snake. I don't know. Just look straight ahead and don't laugh too hard. And y'all just going to have a long lunch conversation. So what, so what did you think about the message, John? Um, I, I'm, I'm saying it's not the time to have people speaking into your life if they ain't speaking life into your life. Come on, man. Come on. You can have questions, but talk to the Savior and not the snake. And you tell you something else that Lord, the, the, the enemy will use to try to get you to run away from God is doubt. The biggest thing, if, 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 if I, it confounds my mind, like the, the idea that when folks have doubt, the first thing they do is leave the church. It's so weird to me. So why don't you stop coming to this world? You know, I just had doubts. I just didn't believe that stuff. I just uh, But when you have doubts, it's time when you come to the church, not walk away from the church. So you got doubts. So instead of coming around the family of faith, you now hanging out with your weed-smoking friends, trying to get theological inspiration and spiritual nurture about God. Like, we need to doubt like Thomas doubted. People give Thomas a bad name. I'm telling you, Thomas showed us how to doubt. And he showed us that doubt exhibits a healthy faith. Because if you was an atheist, you wouldn't have doubts. Because you don't have belief. And doubts only show up when you have belief. Oh, you just missed what I said. You, did, you, did you get that? In order to have a doubt, you got to believe. You, do you understand what I'm saying? I got to believe that the Lakers can win with LeBron. Although this season, I have doubts about it. I, I have strong belief because I can doubt. Thomas was around the disciples. He was around the brethren. He was like, yeah, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It's like Thomas, he did. He's like, man, I got doubts. I don't believe it. He's doubting in the right place. He's doubting in godly community. Some of you need to doubt in godly community. Come to church and say, Pastor Tate, I don't believe it. 
Becky, I don't believe. Pastor Brandon, I don't believe it. I'd rather have you talking to us than Ray Ray. You know what I mean? Like, because we can engage you in your journey. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not only did he doubt, but listen to what he said when he doubted. He says, I don't believe it. Show me his hand. He doubted in community, and he doubted looking for Jesus. Show me. Some of you, you in your doubt, and you need to pray this prayer, Lord, show me your hand. I don't believe. Lord, show me your hand. I'm struggling with my belief. Lord, show me your hand. He doubted, but he was looking for Jesus. And you know what Jesus did? He provided for him. Jesus came with his glorified body. You ever notice he got his glorified body? This is the body he got. This is the re body remix. Like he, his body has been remixed. Homeboy got it going on. You can tell when people saw him, he was radiating. People were in awe. Remember on the road of uh, Emmaus? They looked at him and they, they, were, they were struggling. It's like, whoa. He had this radiated, uh, just glorified body. He's walking. And everything is healed. Everything is put back together. But he said, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. Let's leave the hole in my hand. Jesus, why are you going to leave the hole in your hand? Because uh, I know Thomas. Thomas is going to want to ask some questions. And he's going to be trying to see but where the hole at. So I want to leave this for him to see so he'll know that it's real. Jesus has made accommodations for your doubt. He's not intimidated by your doubt. He's not threatened by your doubt. He had your doubts in mind. He said, here's the hole, Thomas. I knew you were going to be struggling. So I provided a way in the midst of your struggle to bring hope and perspective to you. Now's not the time to run away. Even with doubt, look for Jesus. Um, Jesus, even on the cross, you can hear the loneliness, the isolation. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mike, listen to that. He says, you've left me here. There are times even Jesus felt alone. So whether you're questioning his goodness, whether you have doubts, or whether you feel alone, can I just tell you the presence of God is still the safest place for you to be. I don't know where you run into. His presence is still the safest place for you to be. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus and he's there in the garden, and it's the place of pressing. Uh, it's the idea of where the, the oil comes from the olive. And in order for the oil to come out of the olive, the olive has to be pressed. And it is in the pressing that the oil comes forth out of the olive. He says, it may be a safe place, but it's not a comfortable place. This is a place where you will be pressed by the hand of God. It's good to be in his hands, but you need to know sometimes even being in his hands, he presses you in his hands. He'll press you so that he can produce oil, an anointing out of your life, purpose and destiny. But it's only going to come out of pressing. I've got I've to press this out of you because I'm trying to press greatness out of you. So it may be uncomfortable, but I'm doing something beyond what you can see. So in this moment of pressing, as God presses him, Jesus presses into God. He's praying. He's crying. He's sweating tears. He's sweating blood. He is pressing. As God is pressing into him, he is pressing right back into God. When God is pressing into you, my brother, my sister, that's the time for you to press into God. God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. It's not the time to press away. It's the time to press in. Don't run from him. Run to him. Rest in him. Rely on him. Run to him. Rest in him. Rely on him. Your biggest trial could very well become your greatest victory. I said your biggest trial could become your greatest victory. I'll never forget flunking out of high school. It was commencement day. My friends, cap and gown, preparing to walk across the stage. They were all my friends, so I had to go to the graduation. I'll never forget pulling up to the commencement. I couldn't get out of the car. I was gripped with fear. Shame, embarrassment. I sat in the car the whole time with tears streaming down my face. 
it was one of the lowest moments of my life. I couldn't go into commencement. But in that moment, instead of being angry at God, instead of pulling away from God, I pressed into God. And I said, I realize as I look back over my life now, I look at that moment, I realize I was in God's hand, but God was pressing me. He was pressing every ounce of self-righteousness, self, self ability. I, I, I thought I could do it on my own, but I thought I could do it in my power, but, and I was so independent. But he pressed all of that out, and he was producing an oil on me that I didn't even realize. He was teaching me how to be desperate before him. He was teaching me how to be dependent upon him. And in the pressing of me, I started begging and pressing into God. I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. You see, this is where I got myself. Lord, I don't know who I am. Lord, you tell me who I am. You give me my identity. You give me purpose. You give me the plan. You give me your way. In a very real way, Jesus, you take the wheel because I can't drive. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to be. I don't know who to be. God, you give me my identity. You give me purpose. And as I pressed into him, the oil began to press out of my life. And what was then a moment of guilt and shame when I couldn't go into the commencement in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be speaking at a commencement with a robe, with a cap, and a gown declaring the glory of the Lord. My test became my testimony. My mess became a message of his power and his glory. I'm telling you, God has a plan greater than what you can see. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to speak at a commencement. I got my robe boarded. I got my hat. I got my thing. Because in that car, in that parking lot, that's where Satan thought he defeated me. So I'm going to have my gown on. I'm going to get in the car. I'm going to get out of my car. I'm going to stand in the parking lot. I'm going to take a bunch of selfies all on my Instagram. And I'm just going to say, devil, you are a liar. This is the place where you wanted me to give up. This is the place where you wanted me to quit. But my greatest trial has now become my greatest victory. If you've ever been pressed by God and he's produced all on your life. You ought to give him a praise and say thank you for the pressing. Thank you for releasing an oil. Thank you for releasing purpose. Thank you for showing me who I am. My greatest trial will be my greatest victory. Devil, no weapon formed against me will be able to prosper. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There's purpose inside of here. There's promises inside of here. Oh, run away. Turn around and just encourage three people. Don't play with them. Encourage them. Tell them, don't you run away now. Tell them, don't you run away now. Don't you run away now. Don't you run away now. Away now. Remember not to run away. Point number three, here it is. Remember to pray big prayers. Elijah, he got a dead body up under him. And with the dead body, all the whole band came out. All right, y'all just get comfortable. I'm, we'll shout again in a few minutes. Uh, he, he got the whole, he got a dead body up under him. And, and he says, Lord, bring life back to this dead body. Theologians and historians will say, Elijah had never seen a resurrection before. He never seen somebody come back from the dead. So it's not like he's asking, Lord, do what you did over there, over here. No, this is something he's never seen before. It's never been done before. The audacity of his faith to ask God to do something he's never even seen. Oh, I'm talking to somebody in here because God's got you asking for something you've never seen. Elijah says, I ain't never seen a dead body come back to life. 
You're right, I ain't never seen that. But I did see that raven come every morning with food. I did see that raven come every evening with food. I did see this widow reach into a flower bucket and an oil basket, and every time it had flour and oil in there, and I've been eating from it every day. So although I ain't seen this, I did see that. And if he can do that, then God can still do this. Ask big prayers. Pray big prayers. One of the biggest epidemics of the church is we pray these anemic prayers. These weak prayers that ain't got no big hopes, no big expectations. You're just shy and you set the bar real low for God. Says, ask me for big stuff. I'm a big God. Why are you asking me for such little things? Some of you, you need big things in your life. Your family needs big things. Your marriage needs big things. Your children needs big things. Ask for the big thing. You got a big old God who delights in your joy. It's prayer. Ask. Some of you got some big mountains ahead of you. Don't you know God says, I'll move that mountain? You are one prayer away. Tony Evans talks about it, a house, and it's wired for electrical, which is how the house is powered. The power goes through the electricity, and that power then provides light. So you got a light, you got a light bulb, you got a light fixture. The power provided the light, but in order for the power to produce the light that has already been provided, there has to be a point of contact. There's got to be a light switch. You can have the power on this side, um, the provision for the light on this side, but if you don't have a point of contact and turn that switch on, you can have power and provision and no light. Woo, I'm going to preach myself happy in a few minutes. I love, I'm, I'm, God is saying, I got power for it. I got provision for it. You just ain't got the faith for it. Only thing standing in between my power and my provision is your prayers. I think one of the most sobering moments is when we walk to heaven and we get in heaven and we're going to see a room. It's going to be marked with blessing after blessing after blessing. We're going to say, no, Lord, what is this? He's going to say, oh, this is the room that had all the things according to my will that were provided for you by my power that you never prayed for. You, oh, you don't believe it. You, you, think, you think I'm making that up. The book of James, James says, you have not because you. <laughs> Start praying big prayers. God says, according to my will, I've got the power to do it. I've already provided. The light fixture and the lights are already there. How you look walking around in your house complaining about the dark? He just said, all you need to do is become the point of contact. Turn your prayer zone. Flip your prayer zone and you will begin to see the light that's already been provided. Not only pray big prayers, but pray like you already know what the end is going to be. You need to pray like you already know what the end is going to be. Like God is good and he will do what he said he's going to do. Pray like it. Pray with belief like you know what the end's going to be. I was a scary child. I was scary, y'all. I was scary. I didn't like, I don't do roller coasters. I don't do heights. I don't do nothing. I was scary. I, I didn't like none of that stuff. As a young child, I didn't watch no scary movies, no Freddy Krueger. I, rebu I rebuked Freddy in the name of Jesus from a young age. Uh, Chucky. Only Chucky I do is with cheese. I don't do... I don't fool around with none of them. It's demonic, and I ain't going there. It's, I'm scary. I'm scary. All you got to do is boo. Woo! I'm scared already. You had me a boo. That's all you had to do. I, I don't fool around. I'm scared. So even reading books, you know, these little books in Disney, they'll put something, they'll sneak an enemy in there. I'm still scared of Ursula. Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, my kids be like, Dad, where you going? It's like, I can't do it, kids. I call, me when, call me when they start singing at the end. Uh, so we'd be reading books, and I'm telling you, even as a child, we'd be reading books. And the big, the big 
bad wolf. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Them three, them three characteristics that I don't need to be big, bad, and wolf. Okay, no, we need to find something else to read. I get scared. I couldn't even finish the book. But I learned the secret. What I learned to do is the big, bad wolf. And the tension, I'd be like, oh, God, what's going to happen? I learned how to flip to the end. And I see over here, and they lived happily ever after. Oh, that truth gave me the ability to go back over here and to read this big bad wolf. And I say, although you're a big bad wolf, I know in the end we're going to live happily after Alpha so I can make it through this chapter because I know how the end's going to be. Oh, I wish I had a witness up in here. You may be up against a big bad wolf, but look at the end. We win and we will live happily. So you may be facing a big bad wolf now. Let me tell you, flip over to the end of the book. My sister, you're going to win. My brother, you're going to win. Because Jesus Christ has already fixed the fight. He already fixed the fight. I'll tell you how he fixed it next Sunday. But here's a sneak preview. Early Sunday morning, he got He fixed it. So remember, it's the last one and we're going to go home. Why is that funny? Y'all know I'm not telling the truth, don't you? He, um, remember who he is. Remember now ain't the time to run away. Remember to pray big prayers. And finally, remember he's a good father. He's a good father. He's a good father. Listen, and I know some of you are saying, Albert, every story doesn't end with a resurrection. Every story doesn't end. This story ended with the boy, he got up, but every story doesn't end that way. I know. But can I just tell you, you know what happened to this boy. You know he eventually died again. Lazarus died again. Remember the first Sunday we were talking about the little the woman with the boy and he stopped the funeral procession? Oh, it was another funeral procession later. They all eventually died. So don't allow death to become the fear. Don't walk around scared of death. We all going to die. We all terminal. Some of us just know it before others. But we all terminal. We all got an end date. But God says you don't have to fear death. Because I got victory over death. So when he gives us life, he gives us life even in the midst of death. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So yeah, every day now in heaven, there's a roll call. And they call your name every day. Andrew, absent. Andrew, absent. Andrew, absent. Andrew, absent. But one day, you'll say goodbye to this old world. And they'll say, Andrew, and for the first time, you'll say present. In the presence of God. I'm here, Jesus. It's to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So don't you be afraid of death because in death, God has given you life. But there will be painful days. There will be hard days and some of you are in them. Our, our little boy, we, we've done this four times now. And we got the rhythm. When our kids have to get the vaccine shots, um, my wife is now settled in her soul she don't even go. She don't even go. She don't even get in the building. She just stay in the car, and she send me in because it's, it's too painful for her to watch. And, and, and you know the vaccine shot, so, you, you know, your child don't get measles uh, and, and good stuff like that. We believe it, that, you know, so, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we, we give the baby the shot so they don't be walking around catching stuff. Um, but, it, but, it's, but it's not easy. It's painful. You, you ever seen a baby get a, get a shot for the first time? It's the first time they experience pain in their life. It's the first time. So I'm sitting there, mama in the car in the fetal position, and I'm... <laughs> Y'all came out early this time. I didn't see that. I was coming out that early. Um, and I got Micah 
And I'm holding him and I'm looking at his face and looking at him. And then this nurse sticks this syringe in his thigh. And he looks at me. <laughs> you just going to sit here and watch this go down? You, you just going to let her, you saw that coming at me. You just going to let her stick that in my thigh? And you just going to sit there looking, making goo, goo goo faces at me? Dad, what are you doing? This is painful. And he begins to scream and cry. And I'm sitting there looking at him. And I'm sitting here letting her do it. And he is confused in his understanding. He cannot comprehend why daddy's letting this woman stick this thing in my thigh and make me scream and cry like this. Well, in the sovereignty of my fatherhood, I know that although it's painful right now, this pain won't last always. I know that there's something greater working than this moment. So I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to carry you in your tears. And I know in just a little while, you're going to be all right. In just a little while, you gonna feel better. So I'm a good father, but I'll still allow pain because I know that there's something greater on the other side. Well, if I'm an earthly father and I'll do that for my earthly child, how much more does our heavenly father do for us when he allows pain in our life? I know it's painful right now, but this won't last always on the other side. What's happening to you ain't greater than what I'm providing for you. I'll say that again. What's happening to you, what I'm allowing to happen to you, is not greater than what I'm providing for you. So even in the pain, trust me. Gives and takes away. Gives and takes away. My heart will choose to say. Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Sometimes you got to cry it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. We've got a God gives and it takes away. Blessed be your name for your glory. Amen.